Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hendrickson. I work with leaders and teams. Okay, friends, we have to talk about meetings. Does your calendar look like a wall of back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back meetings? Are you constantly five minutes late to your next thing because either your previous thing ran over or you hadn't had a break in four hours and had to make the excruciating choice between being a little bit late to your next meeting so you could grab a water or passing out from dehydration? Do you find yourself having to block off time on your calendar so that you can actually focus and work? Or do you struggle to find a time when everyone can meet because everyone else's calendar is constantly double booked? Think of this as your calendar intervention. Before we get into this, I have to acknowledge that the higher up you go in an organization, the more likely it is that your entire job centers around talking to people. So yes, you're going to have a lot of meetings. But no, you don't have to spend your days navigating double and triple booked time slots. I want you to take a look at your calendar. Go ahead, bring it up right now. Just eyeball it. Later, you can take the time to do a deep dive analysis. But for right now, bring up the weekly view and just skim through your week. Look at how much of your time this week is being spent in regular recurring meetings, one-off meetings, one-on-ones, and guest appearances at other people's meetings. Picture yourself in every one of those meetings and ask yourself, why am I here? I don't mean this like a rhetorical question. In fact, it's such an important question. I want you to ask it three ways. Why am I here? Why am I here? And why am I here? Let's start with the first one. Why am I here? This is about purpose. Every meeting needs a purpose, a why. What will be different at the end of this meeting that wasn't true at the beginning? Or as Janice and Jason Frazier said in Farther, Faster, and Far Less Drama, every meeting needs an A to B, a statement of the starting place and the intended outcome. That's different from an agenda. If you have no idea what the purpose of the meeting is, get clarity before you attend. Your time is too valuable to risk it on an undefined exercise or you could decline to attend. But maybe you don't feel safe declining. In one organization I worked for, I attended meetings because I was afraid of what would happen if I didn't. It didn't even matter what the meeting was. If I was invited, I went, because I knew that if I didn't go, the people who did go would make commitments on my behalf. Well, since Elizabeth isn't here to chime in, we'll assume that. And my fear was founded in reality. If I skipped those meetings and disagreed with the outcome, I would be told, well, then you should have made it a priority to be there. But that's a larger cultural problem. And I was even in a leadership role. I had influence. I needed to tackle the dysfunction head on, calling out people for making decisions on my behalf when I wasn't there, and working with meeting organizers to ensure that every meeting had a clear purpose that they stuck to. None of this, while I have you all here, agenda commandeering, that at least in that company was so common. I needed to step up and lead, not passively accept that my schedule would be dictated by whoever decided to splat a meeting on the calendar. So only attend meetings when the answer to why am I here is that there is a clear and valuable purpose. And don't be afraid to have the awkward conversation about why and meeting culture. If you feel pressured to attend meetings just because it's the cultural norm, that's not a good enough reason. Okay, so you know the why. Next, why am I here? Maybe you shouldn't be the one in the room. Maybe you can free up time on your calendar by making sure the right person or people are invited and putting your trust in them. One of the traps that I fell into in my first couple of years in management roles was thinking that I needed to represent my team in all cross-functional meetings. This was in a siloed organization. I spent so much of my time in meetings that I didn't have time to debrief each meeting with my team. So I'd forget what I'd told them and what I hadn't, and my team and I lived in two different worlds. I spent my days getting context and making decisions, and they didn't have the information they needed to do their jobs. Instead of attending every meeting myself, I should have had team members represent us. That was an important lesson for me to learn as a manager. 
don't put myself in the position of being the information hub. That's not what the job of manager is about. Or consider another situation. Once upon a time when I was an engineering director, I received an invitation to a cross-team problem-solving meeting. The people doing the actual work were all invited, and so were the leaders who could make staffing decisions and commitments, and who had a responsibility for the outcomes. It made sense that the organizer included all of us. She was covering her bases. I thought the meeting was important. I wanted it to happen, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure that I was needed. On the other hand, I knew that if I declined the meeting, others might see that as a sign that I didn't see value in it, and that was not the message I wanted to send. Plus, depending on how the meeting went, I might be needed. So I accepted the meeting and made a point of showing up on time. I listened for the first several minutes, and I realized that they didn't need me after all. The right people were already there. I trusted them to make whatever decisions or commitments were needed. Open space is a way of running gatherings like conferences, and the open space law of mobility says that if you aren't bringing value or getting value, you have a right and even an obligation to go somewhere else where you will. So I waited a few minutes for an appropriate pause in the discussion, and then I stood up and I said, "This meeting is really important. I'm glad you're having it." However, I've realized that you don't need me. You have all the right people here to make these decisions. I trust you. And then I left. Another meeting participant, a manager, was right on my heels out the door. I was suddenly very worried that I'd caused the meeting to break up or that she was upset. But once we were both in the hall, she turned to me and said, "Thank you." She said that she realized that she also also wasn't needed. But that it had never occurred to her before that she could excuse herself from a meeting in progress. Until I left, she thought it would have been too rude to leave. She was prepared to waste an entire hour in a meeting doing nothing. My action didn't just save my time; it saved hers too, and it became an example that shaped the culture moving forward. Future cross-team problem-solving meetings involved all the necessary participants, and no unnecessary overhead, like me. So the lesson here is: if you're not going to get value out of it or contribute value to it, you're not needed. You can skip it. You have my permission. Okay, on to the last one. Why am I here? Let's assume the purpose is really important, and you personally do need to be involved. But why now? Why in this venue? Should this be a topic covered elsewhere, or could this meeting have been an email? One-on-ones are a great example of this. Okay, hear me out. I'm not opposed to one-on-ones at all. I think they're really, really important. But if you use one-on-one time to discuss the project, to discuss the work, that's probably a waste of time. You're going to have to have the same discussion or a closely related one with other team members. Worse than being an inefficient use of your time, there's a high probability it's an inefficient use of everyone else's. By holding the same conversation multiple times with different subsets of constituents, different people hear different things and then have to reconcile their understanding in yet another meeting. So keep one-on-ones for things that should be private. Like career development discussions, individual feedback, or performance discussions, move any kind of project or status discussions to meetings where the whole team is present. If you're thinking, "But I don't have that much else to discuss in that one-on-one besides the work," then you're either missing an opportunity for deeper individual conversations, or maybe you should hold that one-on-one less frequently. Status meetings are another huge offender. So often they turn into a status ritual where everyone is multitasking, doing their email, while awaiting their turn to speak. Consider the question: Is there a reason why this meeting must be synchronous? Do we all have to do this together, or couldn't this be something asynchronous—a document, an email thread, a Slack conversation, or a dashboard? One organization I was part of had a problem with long-running stand-up meetings in the morning. The information density was. Low, and the team didn't use the time to coordinate activities. It was a status ritual. They moved it to Slack, 
and got half an hour of their day back every day with no loss in value. The real lesson, lesson here is to never use a communication solution, that is, a meeting, to a visibility problem, like wanting to know what everyone is up to. If the meeting could be replaced by a dashboard or a Slack thread, you win! Time is a non-renewable resource. That meeting that just ate up an hour of your life, that's time that you're never going to get back. Was it worth it? Did you invest that time wisely? Ultimately, I believe that the only valid reason to have an actual synchronous meeting is to collaborate on shared work in real time. That might mean debating or a decision or solving a problem or sharing information and ideas in a high bandwidth forum, but whatever the purpose, the vibe is collaborative and everyone is engaged. It's not a performance and it's not a ritual. It's actual shared work. There may be occasional exceptions like large town halls, but that's the exception, not a day-to-day -day occurrence. And that's where shifting the culture comes in. The best way to fix your calendar is to shift the culture around meetings. Encourage everyone to ask, why am I here? Oh, and if you're a leader with authority, don't try to fix your calendar by declaring no meeting Mondays. That just guarantees that Monday is the only day that people can find time on everyone's calendar. And it ends up with, you know, those shh, don't tell anyone, we're breaking the rules, but we have to have a meeting. So instead, set the expectation about what meetings are for. Find ways to encourage and reward people for increasing visibility to avoid time-sucking time status rituals or for adopting asynchronous information sharing solutions where appropriate. Highlight and praise high-value meetings with engaged participants directly collaborating. Feed what you want to grow. And over time, the mindset will shift from meetings as the default for every kind of interaction to having a range of options depending on the need. So that's my rant on meetings. I hope that you are able to use some of these ideas to carve back even just a few hours on your busy calendar this week. Thank you for listening. Until next time.